What I'm going to talk about today is um, a little bit of a uh, status report on the language features that I started to talk about last year at this time. So last year, John and I did a uh, J, uh, JVM slash Java language roadmap, and we talked about value types, and we talked about specialized generics. And over the last year, we've been working on prototypes for, uh, for generics over primitives and generics over values. And so this talk is a little bit about what we've learned and how the design has evolved and how we've implemented it. So obvious disclaimer slide. This is all experimental. Don't believe anything I say. So I've organized this as a sort of play in three parts uh, to illustrate sort of each of, the, um, each of the phases of it. So this is the sort of background prologue. Um, this is a line from uh, the Major General song, uh, a play on the line from the Major General song in uh, Pirates of Penzance. The, if, 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 uh, but it, the, the, the idea here is we want to expand the scope of parametric polymorphism in Java. We want to have better generics. We want to have generics over primitives and over value types. So what's wrong with the generics we have? Why, why isn't it good enough? Well, if you want to have a list of, of integers, you actually have to have a list of boxed integers. And from an expressiveness and a functionality point of view, that's just fine. But from a performance perspective, that's not so fine. What people really would rather have is an array, a, a list of int. And if you have an array list, you'd like it to be backed by a real int array and not an array of boxed integers. And the reason for that is when you box a, a number to an object, that takes a lot more memory. You have space for an object header. You have space for a pointer. Uh, but it also is much less cache friendly. Uh, you take indirections every time you try to get to your actual data. And if you take an array of boxed integers and you try to do a parallel operation over them, on most systems you'll find that you don't get any actual parallelism out of that because you're bound by memory bandwidth. Uh, with all those indirections, you're spending all your time cache missing and not at any time adding numbers up. So we'd like to be able to flatten data out. And if we're adding value types to the language, they need to play nicely with generics. And it would really be terrible to say, well, we're adding value types over here for performance, but if you want to generify over them, you have to go back to boxing. That would kind of undermine the point. So we want generics to play nicely with value types. And primitives are a form of value types. So as a refresher, generics in Java use a technique called erasure, which means we throw away the type information. We, uh, so if we say list of t, where t has a bound, usually object, we erase all occurrences of t to object. Um, so if you try to do generics over uh, primitives, you run into a couple of roadblocks. Uh, one of them is, um, you know, ha has to do with the type system, and another of them has to do with the, uh, the bytecode instruction set. So from a type system perspective, you, um, you know, the, the bound of a uh, type variable should be a supertype of all the possible instantiations. Well, there isn't a common supertype between int and string. So that's kind of a problem. And from a bytecode perspective, uh, when we compile a, a program down to bytecode, if you want to move a ref, you use a load and a store. If you want to move an int, you use i load and i store. There's no bytecode that can move both an int and a ref. And this was well understood in 2004 when we did generics. And as an expedient compromise, we said, uh, all right, I guess you can't generify over primitives. And that seemed like a reasonable compromise at the time. Uh, and as hardware has evolved, it's become more and more of a painful compromise. And with value types on the scene, it becomes an untenable compromise. So we've got to go back and fix this. So parametric polymorphism has a lot of trade-offs inherent in it. One of the biggest trade-offs is you're trading off type specificity, which compilers love, against footprint. So uh, different languages pick different uh, points on this spectrum. So in C++, you take a very straightforward template approach, list of int, list of string, list of uh, float, completely different types. You just stamp out the templates. This is great for uh, interacts nicely with operator overloading and, and, and all of that. Great type specificity, terrible code sharing. So your applications balloon up in size. Uh, .NET took a different approach, uh, and their approach is quite nice, uh, where they pushed the parametricity into the bytecodes. 
So they have parametric bytecodes. So when you, uh, where, where we have a load and I load and, and, and a store, they have parameterized load and store bytecodes where you're saying load a T, store a T, return a T. And that's good for type specificity. It's good for sharing. It's not so great for VM complexity. So that was a, uh, a big cost that they, 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 they took on. Um, existing Java generics sort of are this uh, you know, um, mi middle compromise where we get good sharing with array generics because we have one class file for all the instantiations of array list. But as we've said before, it doesn't play nicely with primitives, and we want to fix that. And so the question is, of the various uh, approaches that other languages have taken, which, which one is our approach going to look most like? And obviously, there are others uh, besides C Sharp and C++, but these are examples. OK. And all of this uh, has to be done following the prime directive, which is compatibility. We need binary compatibility. Existing class files have to continue to work. They have to continue to mean the same thing. Source compatibility. Existing source files have to continue to work and have to continue to mean the same thing. We can't change their semantics when we recompile them just because the language has changed. And more, we need yeah, that. But wait, there's more. We need migration compatibility. We need to be able to take a existing generic type hierarchy, like collections, uh, which is currently now restricted to reference instantiations, and migrate it so that you can have value instantiations without forcing the clients to also upgrade. So you need to be able to uh, upgrade your library separately from upgrading your clients. So that's a lot of constraints. Um, and at the same time, we would like you know, to be able to take advantage of things the VM can do for us. We're willing to add VM features to support this. But what we don't want to do is take Java's type system and impose it on the VM. Uh, we don't want to force other languages to deal with our own bizarre notions of wildcards and, and, and things like that. And so there's a lot of constraints we're under. So let's take a look at uh, what our, our first approach was. Uh, which is the approach that we described uh, s sort of last year at this time, which was largely a templating-based approach, very, you know, very similar to the, uh, the C++ approach. Um, and you know, this was, I think, a useful experiment. We learned some things from it. Uh, so let me explain how it works. So in this approach, we say when we uh, compile an AnyFi generic class, the compiler continues to generate an erase class file. So the class, the bytecodes it generates is the same bytecodes it generated in Java 8. But we augment that class file with type metadata so that the class file kind of does double duty as both a class file and a template. And so if you want a list of string, it just takes the er erased list class and loads that and uses that, no problem. But if you want a list of int, it takes the erased list class that's been augmented with this metadata, uses it as a template, and stamps out a specialized list of int class. So that actually works pretty well. Um, and then as a sort of temporary hack, this is obviously not the long-term plan, we used name mangling to describe what the uh, specialized classes would look like. So if you have a class foo of t, uh, we have this name mangling scheme, of foo dollar zero equal i, meaning uh, instantiate the first type variable with, uh, with int. Good enough for a prototype. And then we hack this into the class loader, where if you go to load a class that has a mangled name and it can't find it in the file system, it calls the specializer. It, it, you know, so when you go looking for foo dollar zero equal i, it doesn't, it doesn't find that. So it goes, loads foo, specializes it, and loads that class. And that all works. Fine prototype technique. Um, so let's take an example. So we've got a class uh, box of any t. Uh, it has a field uh, of type t. It has a get method that returns a t. Uh, so straightforward data holder class. Uh, and when we compile it, we erase t to object, same as we always did. So the uh, signature of the field and the signature of the uh, uh, constructor argument and the return type of get uh, get erased to object. When we specialize that, we need to specialize the signatures. So uh, we specialize it. We're uh, you know, uh, giving it a new name. We're specializing the signature of the, uh, the, you know, the, the val field. And we're specializing the, the signature of the constructor and the get method to take or return int instead of, um, instead of object. That's pretty straightforward, but there's more to it. 
Okay, because we can't just specialize the signatures, we also have to specialize the bytecode. If we've changed a method to, uh, to return int instead of object, it had better execute an I return instead of an A return, otherwise the verifier will complain. So, we, and we also have to be careful about which occurrences of objects do we replace with int. We can't replace them all, obviously. Maybe the, other, you know, the user actually used objects in the signature of one of their, their methods. Uh, maybe there's multiple type variables. So we have to be a little bit careful about which A loads we turn to I loads and which objects we turn to int. Um, so we need some generic information about uh, what the signatures of the various, you know, uh, various types were in terms of uninstantiated type variables in our class file. It turns out that the signature information is already mostly there, the compiler already mostly emits that, so we just need to add some extra information uh, to annotate the bytecode about what types are being moved. Uh, so we added an attribute to the, uh, the class file called bytecode mapping. It's basically a table indexed by bytecode index to metadata about what that bytecode does. Now, this is a terribly brittle technique. We wouldn't do this in production because, you know, you run this through some bytecode mangler and all your bytecode ind indices have been changed and then the specializer will do the wrong thing. So we're well aware that this is not a, uh, a great technique for production, but again, perfectly fine for prototyping. So, all right, so example of specializing a signature, I have a class foo of any t, extends bar of t, and uh, the compiler already today generates a signature attribute for us that says the supertype of, um, of, of foo is, uh, is bar angle bracket you know, type variable t. This is, this, since Java 5, we've had signatures like this in the bytecode. Um, and so the specializer, when it's going to specialize t for int, it can take advantage of that. It can substitute an int for that tt and then say, oh, I know the representation of bar of int is really bar dollar zero equal i and do the substitutions. And that's, that's really straightforward stuff. Um, so when we specialize this class, uh, we have to specialize you know, not, you know, the signature of, for example, its supertypes, and we do that by straightforward substitution on the, uh, the signature metadata. So that part's easy. What about the bytecode? Well, different kinds of bytecode need different treatments. So the simple bytecodes, the ones that move data around, a load, a store, a return, things like that, they're just one byte bytecodes. They don't have any place to put type information, so we use the, the bytecode mapping attribute as a place to put side information. So, uh, you know, you, if, if you have this, uh, this method that just takes a T and returns its argument, it compiles down to bytecode that looks like this, just to a load one, a return. Um, and you see the bytecode mapping attribute has two entries, one for the, uh, the a load instruction, one for the a return instruction, that says, here's the type of the thing being moved by this instruction. So when we specialize the, uh, the class, we're saying, all right, well, a load one is moving um, a t, t is specialized as int, so I have to turn that into i load. And same thing for the a return. <coughs> so when we specialize this class, the specializer takes the bytecode mapping, takes the type parameters, uh, folds everything together, together and then adjusts the, uh, the, the bytecodes. This isn't hard, it's just fiddly. Gets more fiddly. Okay, so different kinds of bytecodes need different kinds of metadata. So let's say we're instantiating an object. I'm saying uh, I want to create a new foo of t. Well, what's the class name of what I'm going to create? Well, that depends based on what t is. Because we're using this name mangling technique, we want to instantiate a foo dollar zero equal i if t is int. So again, we use the bytecode mapping attribute where we say, here is the uninstantiated type of the thing being created. So when I specialize this, can, can you guys see the code in the, in the, in the back there? All right, so when I, when I specialize this for t equal int, I'm gonna, you know, um, I'm gonna substitute int for tt, I'm gonna turn that into foo dollar zero equal i, and when I specialize the class, the, uh, the, the operand of the new instruction is not foo, but foo dollar zero equal i. Again, fairly straightforward, you know, not, not too nasty. Uh, gets better. Okay, supposing I have a method um, that's going to access a field. So uh, the get method fetches the t field and returns that. So uh, when we compile that, we have a much more complicated uh, bytecode mapping attribute for the bytecode uh, index that, it, that it's corresponding to the get field. And that's because we have to specialize two things. There are two, uh, the, the operand to a get field instruction is a, na uh, is a, name, and, a name and type. Uh, and we have to specialize potentially the type and the name of the class holding the, 
the, um, the field because both of those might change. And so we encode two bits of information in the uh, bytecode mapping. The first is the uh, uninstantiated type of the receiver, and the second is the uninstantiated type of the, um, the thing being moved. And when we specialize it, we turn this get field of foo.t, which is object, into foo dollars zero equal i dot t, which is of type int. So we're just cramming two things into one bag here, but it's in theory no more complicated than the previous one. I'll just show you what it looks like for an invoke dynamic. I won't work through the details because it's uh, pretty frightening. Uh, but essentially, uh, what's going on here is we have to ca uh, capture the type information for all of the elements of the invoke dynamic argument list. And again, this really isn't very hard. It's just, you know, the, the, you, you, you get the point. The complexity level is going up and up and up. And we have to do something different for each kind of bytecode. And OK, fine. But it's a fairly straightforward game. So we got that working in a few days. That did not, it was not that hard. Um, you know, the, the, the compiler basically just didn't throw away a lot of information that it otherwise would have thrown away. And the specializer is a straightforward bytecode mangler that um, you know, uses this type information, does some substitution and string you know, manipulation, and figures out what new signatures to emit and what new bytecodes to emit. There's a little bit more to it. So that was about specialization of generic classes. What about generic methods? Generic methods are trickier because for any given generic method, there may be many instantiations of the same method. And while we have a straightforward way of saying, take this class and specialize it into this class, uh, as Vladimir pointed out uh, you know, earlier, um, we don't really have a way of saying, here's a free-floating method, just install this in the class. We always have to wrap classes and methods. Uh, but we can do that. So uh, we use uh, invoke dynamic here, where uh, if you're invoking a generic specializable method, uh, the compiler generates an invoke dynamic. The bootstrap is generic method specializer. And the arguments are, what are my specialization parameters? And after that, it's pretty much the same turn the crank as specializing a class. You go find the class that has that method. You get its bytecodes. You run the same specialization game that, uh, that we ran on the whole class. And then we have to do something to actually install that method. So we use unsafe.defineAnonymousClass. And we use the clever uh, host class trick that define anonymous class gives you that essentially lets you treat that new method as having all of the accessibility uh, context of the class that it was, um, it was part of. So that way, access to private, you know, uh, private members and all that works just fine. Um, generic instance methods are, um, are, are more complicated because in order to know what method to specialize, you also have to know the receiver type. And that means you have to do this dynamically. You have, you know, rather than saying, oh, I'm going to specialize this, uh, th this method statically and install a constant call site, there's an extra level of indirection in the bootstrap where it does a resolution of, given this receiver type, what method would I call? Let me go specialize that. And then it uses a polymorphic inline cache to, uh, on the, uh, the type of the receiver uh, at the call site. So I know that was you know, a lot of fast hand waving. The point is. This is straightforward enough, but there's lots of fiddly little bits of complexity where each bytecode has to get its own treatment and, and all of that. And then there's like nasty corner cases like super calls um, and interactions with other um, compiler artifacts like how we translate lambdas, which are all doable, but they're, you know, they each require their own treatment. Andre, it sounded like you had a question. So, so, so the, qu the question is, how do you know you can always get the, uh, the bytecode? So, so right now what we're doing is um, we're not worrying about that problem. We're asking the class loader, load the resource, you know, foo.class, and give me the bytecodes. Obviously, there's more work to do. Um, you know, that, you know, so, so for, you know, we're, we're going to have to make some tweaks in the class loader so that the class loader can record whether it loaded it off disk and can reload the bytecodes for you, or if it's a specializable method and it hasn't, you know, and it's not loading it off disk, then in the, the, you know, it may have to cache the, uh, but that's all, that's all doable. Okay, so we're not actually done. There's more fun here. Uh, so 
The bytecode set isn't perfect, and it's not fully orthogonal. So there are some bytecodes, like you know, a load, which are nicely orthogonal, a load, i load, you know, uh, f load, etc. But some bytecodes, like the compare and branch, like if a comp, there's no corresponding if i comp. So I, I can't just replace an if a comp with an if i comp. I have to replace it with a combination of an if a comp and a, and a branch. And the problem with that is now I ha I, I'm not keeping my bytecode indexes um, all nicely lined up, which means my line number tables all screwed up and all of that. So that's unfortunate, but you know that's that's doable too. Um, and accessibility is also uh, a, a little bit uh, a little bit tricky because you know if you reference a you know a private field of some other instantiation, from a source perspective, it looks like you're just accessing something in the same class, but from the VM perspective, you're accessing across class boundaries, and we need to generate little accessor methods to help you out on that. Um, so, you know, plenty of, plenty of little bits of complexity. So, so how will you move into a production quality and non bytecode index dependent solution for this? Um, next year's talk. Oh, OK. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so to sort of, sort of sum up Act 1 here, um, I'll, I'm going to take questions at the end. I, 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 yeah. um, to sum up Act 1 here, we've got some pros and cons. This technique works. Yay! It works on the VM that we actually have, not the theoretical VM we imagine we would like to have. Um, so that's, that, that's huge, right? Uh, so is it a success? Well, uh, it was kind of a complicated set of you know, details to manage in this transform and lots of things that we punted on and haven't even done yet, right? Uh, so you know, it's kind of a messy experiment. But also, we're not so thrilled with the resulting um, uh, type system that we get. And this is a bigger problem. So for example, right now, if you have foo of string and foo of integer, they have a common supertype that isn't object, it's foo of question. You have a way to describe any foo. In this uh, model, there is no common supertype other than object, you, so there's no way to describe any instantiation of foo. And if you actually try to write libraries with this, you'll discover this is a big impediment. You know, so if you look at existing Java libraries, they all have to cheat a little bit. Um, you know, Mar Martin Odersky was saying how important it is to have an escape hatch sometimes. You know, real world Java libraries cheat all the time with uh, wildcard types or worse. Um, and to not have that tool is a huge impediment. Um, and still, we get terrible sharing characteristics, right? It's just like the C++ solution. There's no ability to share code between array list of int and array list of float, even though so much of the code really would be the same. So I would call this a mixed result. You know, some things worked, some things didn't work so well. Uh, nothing impossible, lots of small complexities. So I, the, the next problem that we addressed ourselves to is, all right, well, we've got this problem of not having wildcards. Let's see if we can work wildcards back into the system. Um, so it's kind of a fu funny uh, experience we had, where on the one hand, the thing people complain most about in Java is wildcards. But actually, they complain even more when you try to take their wildcards away. <laughs> and, and we kind of discovered this the, uh, the, the painful way. Uh, but the reality is wildcards are often needed. It's a technique that a lot of real-world libraries, especially our own libraries like collections and streams, use. And wildcards become even more important when you have a heterogeneous translation model here where, you know, right now, foo of int and foo of string are not the same class. So if they're represented by different class, you want to have some way to express their essential commonality, their, their basic foo-ness, as it were. So, um, all right, so let's imagine we did have a wildcard that worked over any types. How would it work? So, all right, let's say I say class foo of any t extends bar of t. So what subtyping relations would we want? Well, certainly we would like to have foo of int be a subtype of foo of question mark. And also foo of int has to be a subtype of bar of int. So already we've discovered that we can't represent the wildcard as a class, the way we do with existing reference generics, because you can't extend two classes, and bar of int is certainly a class, so foo of int would have to be something else. Um, and from an interpretation perspective, we, we, we have a, a sort of can't win situation where if you ask uh, users, what does foo of question mean? They'll tell you, oh, it means foo of anything. 
from a compatibility perspective, foo of question has always meant foo of question extends objects. And we would like it to stay that way. And obviously, we can't satisfy both of these at once. So the answer is, well, we, we punt. We distract people, say, look over there, and, uh, and pull a switcheroo. And the switcheroo we, we, we pull here is say, all right, we're not just going to have the, 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 the trusty old wild card foo of question that we've always had. We're going to, you know, the foo of question will continue to mean what it always meant. We're going to rename it from foo of question to foo of ref to make it clear that this is a wild card over reference instantiations. And we'll introduce a new wild card foo of any, which means foo with any instantiation. And possibly, maybe over time, we'll deprecate the old syntax to be less confusing. And we'll certainly encourage IDE vendors to encourage their, uh, their users to substitute things to the shiny new syntax and all of that. But all right, let's see if we can make this work. Um, so representationally, foo of ref means the same thing foo of question always did. It's the erase type. And that's easy. For foo of any, we, it can't be a class. So, because we want it to be multiple inherited, so the obvious solution is, well, it should be an interface. So we create the synth synth synthetic interface, foo dollar any, to represent the foo of any wildcard. And then we make that a superclass of both foo of int and foo of string. And then we lift all the methods of foo uh, to foo of any, and we might have to box you know, uh, t is along the way. And well, interfaces can't have fields, so we can turn fields into field accessors and implement accessors um, in both the erased and specialized instantiations. Um, and modulo the fact that you will do some, you might do some boxing when you reference a, uh, a member through a receiver of type foo of any. It works pretty cleanly. You shouldn't believe me. It gets complicated. But it's a good story. We'll keep going. All right, so how does this work? Um, we have our trusty box class. We generate the synthetic interface box dollar any. It has some synthetic methods, uh, a getter and a setter for the, uh, the, uh, the val field. And the, um, the, the, the erased implementation has an object valued uh, uh, val field and the obvious accessors just you know, uh, set and return the field. Um, when we specialize, we're specializing the val field uh, to int. And so the accessor implementations, since they have object in their signature, are going to have to box. And that's easy, to, easy enough to do. Um, and so the upshot here is if you're dealing with an instant, a concrete type, foo of string or foo of int, there's no boxing. You go straight to the field. You get exactly what you want. You have the type that you expect. If you're working with uh, a wild card, you might have a more circuitous path to get to the member you're looking for. And this is actually kind of nice, because all of the perform performance costs of having wild cards is borne by people who use wild cards. And people who don't use wild cards get exactly the performance model they expect. So this is actually pretty straightforward and, and, and not too bad. Um, no generic story is complete without a digression into bridge methods. Uh, so I won't disappoint. Um, you'll notice that we have this object, you know, all right, so we have this uh, t-valued get method. When we uh, erase it, we get an object-valued get method, and the erased implementation has that. Um, but the specialized class needs two get methods. It needs the int-valued one, which is the one that will get called if you have a reference of foo of it, a box of int, but it also needs a boxing bridge so that if you call the object version, you get the boxed version. And you know, Java C is used to generating bridges. You know, uh, Maurizio loves to write bridge generation code, so you know, not a problem. All right, a few more examples of uh, how the translation uh, uh, works here. Supposing I have a class box of any t, and I have a couple of fields. One is a box of string. One is a box of int. One is a box of any. And then the last is the, the, the legacy wildcard box of question. How does the compiler translate these? It's actually pretty straightforward. The, um, the things that existed in Java 8 translate exactly the same way. Both the box of string and the box of question get erased to box. The new types um, get translated either to their specialization, so box of int gets translated to box dollar zero equal i, and the any wild card gets uh, translated to the interface box dollar any. This is pretty straightforward. So <coughs> some of you are already thinking, wait a second, classes can have protected or packaged or private fields, and interfaces can't have those. What do we do? So 
this is one of the areas where we need a little bit of help from the VM probably. Uh, access the accessibility rules may need a little <coughs> tweaking. Uh, one way to get there might be to allow private and package uh, members in interfaces. There are some other ways that we're experimenting to get there as well. So right now we don't have a full story for accessibility. We also um, have an issue with accessing private members, which is something that we ran into in Java 1.1 when we added inner classes. Right? So the language interpretation of what private means is I can access anything in the same top level compilation unit. The VM level interpretation of private is I can access anything in this class. So there's a mismatch there and historically we've generated bridge methods when we detect that a, you know, one class in an inner class nest wants to access a private member of another class in an inner class nest, we generate a little bri access bridge for it. This would get much worse. Uh, with uh, when you have specializations where you have something in foo of int wants to access a private member in foo of float. Uh, so we're looking at, um, finally, John has been wanting to do this for years, probably 18 years now, uh, defining a notion of nestmate and defining the, uh, the rules about private member accessibility where two classes in the same nest can access private members of each other. It's, it's a logical thing to do because the user's notion of private access is tied to the whole bundle of classes that are all sort of, uh, you know, inner classes and specializations that are sort of all, all together in a bundle. Um, and if we can align the language notion and the VM notion there, it's a, fair, it's a fairly simple tweak. Um, you know, would make things a lot cleaner and a lot fewer extraneous methods. Okay, Some, somebody in the audience is probably thinking, what about arrays, right? So we talked about how if we have a t-valued member of the, of the class, we're going to lift it to an object-valued member of, um, of, the, uh, you know, of the any interface because you can always convert an object to an object and you can always convert through boxing a primitive to an object or a value to an object. It's not quite so easy with arrays. There's no common supertype between int array and object array. And we don't want to do a boxing conversion between arrays because we're not just boxing one value. We'd be boxing a lot of data. That would be a terrible, terrible idea. So we're not going to do that. Um, but you may have recalled the talk John did two years ago about arrays 2.0. And that approach lines up pretty nicely with what we want to do. What we need here is we want to have a common supertype between an int array and a string array. So let's say we define an interface called, let's, let's say it's called Java Lang Array. And it's an any generic interface. It has a type parameter of what's your element type. Well, we could inject array of int as a supertype of int array and inject raw array or array of object as a supertype of object array. And then they, by the previous trick, they have a common supertype, which is array dollar any. So if we have a t-valued field of an any generic class, when we lift it to the, uh, the, any, the any interface, um, we translate that as array dollar any. And if you're accessing um, to, you know, the, through the um, sharply typed instance, there's no translation, everything's good. If you're accessing it through the wildcard, you're going to go through the array methods. Maybe there'll be some boxing of the elements, but everything still works. So a lot of what's going on here is if we want to extend generics to work over primitives and references, we have to find common supertypes or at least common coercible targets between uh, things like um, int and object, int array and object array, uh, foo of int and foo of object, et cetera. So this actually works pretty cleanly. It's not so bad. So, uh, so the, the array interface might be as simple as I'm an array of any t. I've got a size method. I've got a get method. I've got a set method. And you can still use AA load and AA store if you have a sharply typed reference. And if you have an abstractly typed array reference, you go through the, uh, the interface. OK. Um, so if I have a class that has a field that is of type T array in the, um, in the uh, synthetic any interface, it's going to be typed as array dollar any. OK. So this is kind of where we are now in terms of our prototype. And the good news is this all works. You can go download this, Project Valhalla, build the, the, the JDK image. 
It's a much more reasonable programming model. We've been prototyping with this to port the streams library from you know, uh, Java 8 generics to Valhalla generics. And it's just really smooth. It's exactly what you want. About 70% of the code just evaporates because all of the hand-specialized primitive stuff just goes away. And then a lot of the, the complex machinery to support the hand specialization, that goes away. And it becomes this simple library that like you know, a, a third year student could write. So we consider that to be a pretty uh, successful, uh, you know, su um, successful experiment. And it's library experiments are what validate the language design features, right? You can't design a language in, in the abstract. You know, you have to actually try to write some code with it. Okay, so the pros are we get good compatibility with existing code. It works. We have a pretty reasonable programming model that you can write sophisticated libraries with. We still haven't done much about the code sharing part. Foo of int and foo of string are still totally different classes. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, and the language story is actually pretty simple. Type variables can either be ref or any. Wildcards can be ref or any. In the absence of any, everything is the same as it was yesterday. Um, and then if you have any variables, there are some restrictions on what you can do. Like, for example, you can't assign a null to a t because maybe t is instantiated as a type that doesn't have null in its domain, like int. So um, when you're porting an existing generic class to any generics, you might have used idioms that assume t was an object. The compiler will bark at you when you, uh, when you break those rules, and then you figure out how to migrate it. Most of the migrations are pretty straightforward. OK, so how are we going to get to sharing? Right? How are we going to get to something more like the way .NET represents things, where when, when their JIT runs, they specialize um, one, you know, one, one set of native code for you know, list of 32-bit stuff, and one for list of 64-bit stuff, and they can use the same code for list of double and list of long. We want to get there, right? So how are we going to get there? So um, much of this is being prototyped sort of now as we speak, so we don't have an implementation. We have ideas on a whiteboard um, and, and some partially written code. Uh, the biggest problem of what we got so far is we, we, we don't have a story to let the VM manage the sharing because we're generating the bytecode so early that the, the VM just sees them as the specializations as different classes. Erasure gave us good sharing across reference instantiation. We don't want to give that up. And what that means is we have to push some of this into the VM. But we don't want to push so much into the VM that we make the VM's job too hard. And specifically, the horrible, complicated, death by a thousand cuts specialization story from Act One, I wouldn't want to push that into the VM. And I see the VM guys, you know, making horrible faces in the back room there. Uh, so we need so to find some way to make the specialization transform so brain dead simple that the VM guys won't complain when we dump it on their desk. So the existing class file format is sort of where things landed the week that Java shipped in 1995. There's a lot of ad hocness to the, anybody notice this? Am I the only one who's noticed this? <laughs> There's a certain amount of ad hocness in the class file format and an awful lot of useful information is thrown away. And it's understandable at the time we didn't know we were going to need it, uh, but a lot of that could be worked back into the class file in a less brittle way than what I showed in the first section, um, in a way where if the VM wants it, it can use it, and if it doesn't want it, it can ignore it. Um, no. <laughs> um, but clearly, asking the VM to modify every field signature, every method signature, and every bytecode on specialization is too much. Um, so, we're going to get there in steps. So like the sort of the intermediate step between here and where we want to be is, can we somehow change the problem so that instead of specializing the whole class file, we only have to specialize the constant pool? Constant pool, and then we can share the rest, right? That would be a good step towards getting better sharing. So let's see if we can do that. Um, part of the challenge, um, and we had talks last year from both Charlie and Attila on this exact subject, is the fact that the bytecodes are so strongly typed makes it difficult to describe generic uh, you know, code and bytecodes. You have a load and i load, and if you want to specialize uh, a class to int, you have to swap your a loads for i loads. When we add value types, let's say we, uh, we do so by adding v bytecodes, v load, v return, v store, then the, we still have the same problem. Um, so we need to have um, 
some more polymorphic bytecodes. So we have a lot of different ideas that we've been kicking around for how we might do this. But the simplest one is to say, let's have some universal bytecodes. Let's have a uload, which abstracts over a load and v load and i load and f load. And it just has an extra operand. And that operand is a reference back into the constant pool of what's the type of thing that I'm moving. So if we have a constant in the constant pool that holds an i, and I say, in, 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 in slot number three, and I say you return with operand uh, constant three, it goes to the constant pool and says, oh, this is an i return. This would be one way to do this. I don't want to get too bogged down in the bytecode details. This is more of a, an approach to how we might get there. So one of the cool things that comes out of this is now, instead of having to specialize every a load, I only have to specialize one slot in the constant pool. And all the a loads that point to that same slot have all been specialized in one swoop. That seems like progress. Um, it's also fairly easy to verify, right? The ver verifier says, well, you pushed an I, you popped an I, everything's good. Um, so this is nice. We don't have to touch all the type 1 bytecodes. We only have to touch you know, one constant pool entry for all of the type 1 bytecodes. That's pretty good. Um, and we could conceivably, if we had these u byte codes, we could retire a load and i load and just treat them as you know legacy, uh, overly specialized. I'm not sure, not saying we necessarily would do that, but we could do this. This abstracts over all the byte codes we have. Okay, well, that's not enough, is it? Right? We have some non-orthogonal byte codes, like the comparison byte codes. We would need more, you know, universal shapes for those. We would need maybe a, a u-comp equality bytecode that could compare references or ints or values. But that's not terribly hard to do. Um, and if we did both of these things, at this point, we would be able to specialize all the type 1 bytecodes just by operating on the constant pool. Um, one, one of my guys prototyped this yesterday <laughs> and said, to my surprise, even after adding in these typed uh, bytecodes um, and these extra constant pool uh, I indexes and you know, these extra two bytes on every A load and I load, the class files got smaller because it was still smaller than the specialization metadata we were generating before. So that was kind of a surprising little bit of encouragement there. Uh, but, but clearly there are trade-offs. I mean, uh, you know, the fact that I load is one byte is certainly a nice thing. Throwing that out the window is not necessarily you know, uh, a, a great idea. But all right, we're making progress. Well, what else would we need to do to be able to do specialization just by operating on the constant pool? Well, I kind of waved my hands a little bit when I said we just change one constant in the, you know, in the, in the, the constant pool and you specialize all the, uh, the, you know, the, um, the type 1 bytecodes because, well, what if I have a class that has multiple type variables? How do I know, uh, you know I, I, mo most compilers do pretty ex uh, aggressive interning. So if you have two string constants that say i, they'll get, uh, they'll get mashed into the same thing. And we, don't, um, we lose the information of which ones came from u's and which ones came from v's. So what we want to do is up-level what's in the constant pool to say, well, there was a type variable in the source language. Let's have a representation of a type variable in the constant pool. So we could have a, a constant type for type variable. And what would it have? Well. Uh, who declared the type variable, this class, this method, what have you? What's the name of the type variable? And what are its bounds? t extends you know, comparable of t or something like that. So this is pretty straightforward. We, you know, this, this took us about a half hour to put this into the compiler. Um, and these universal bytecodes could point back to one of these type variable bytecodes, where it's saying, I'm moving a t. And you know, the default would be the, the you know, t must be an erased object, so I'm moving an object. And then when I go to specialize it, I just replace the type variable uh, constant with a string constant for i, and I'm done. <coughs> All right, that seems plausible. Well, right now we have this um, name mangling mechanism, foo dollar zero i. I said you know, all along that was a temporary hack for getting the prototype. So how would we represent a reference to the class foo of int in the bytecode? Well, this is fundamentally a structural type, right? Uh, foo parameterized with my first type variable equal int. All the other types in the JVM are nominal. So we would need a constant to describe a structurally described class. And that's actually pretty straightforward. What's the class I'm parameterizing? 
how many type variables do I have, and instantiations, which are constant pool references to what are my instantiations. So we could represent the description of list of int not with a class constant, but with a parameterized type constant. And all the places you could put a class constant, like the operand of a cast bytecode or, uh, or the, you know, uh, uh, the superclass, who's my superclass, could point to one of these. So this is actually kind of a small juggling of the, uh, the constant pool forms. And then the last one where the class file format we have is kind of a mismatch for what we want is dealing with these complicated concatenated uh, types. Like when you describe the signature of a method, you just glom the type signatures together, L object semicolon, L object semicolon, et cetera. And if some of these types are non-nominal, this doesn't play very nicely, but there's a fairly straightforward way to, um, to put some structure back in that. And you know, so for example, we could represent this signature not as these uh, specific types, but something that describes its structure. It takes two arguments and returns something, and then have a list of constant pool references of what to substitute into the holes. And if the things that substitute into the holes can point to those parameterized type constants, we're actually kind of done. So, and done in a very abstract sort of way. Um, the, po the point is, what we can do is we can turn specialization of the class, which is nasty, into specialization of the constant pool, which is more tractable. And we can actually take that one step further, where we can turn it into specialization not of the, co of the constant pool, but of a distinguished set of constant pool entries, which are the type entries in the constant pool. And now, if specialization is just specialization on types, the language runtime can hand up a function uh, to the VM that says, here's my type specializing function. Apply this whenever you have to specialize something. And the VM doesn't have to know anything about the mapping between instantiated types and representations. It just consults the language runtime and says, all right, if I'm going to make this substitution, what type do I get? And the uh, language runtime hands up a class. So it seems that there is a path to being able to, to let the VM manage all of this specialization without having, to, um, without having to go through all the horrible details that I went through in Act 1. And now the VM gets to decide how much sharing to do. Do I specialize early and get it out of the way, but I have a lot of duplication? Or do I specialize late until I have profiling information about which specializations I really care about? Well, now the VM gets to make that choice, right? And that's a choice that VMs are very good at making. So uh, this gives us a path to sharing as much of the representation between instantiations as the VM feels it is, um, you know, it is appropriate to do so. So how would this actually work? If we have a, a class constant whose payload is a param parameterized type, how does the VM resolve that constant? Well, it has a lot of choices. It could take the really dumb choice, which is, Run the specializer you know, uh, you know, from our prototype. Just turn it into a new class. Don't try to do any sharing. Just load the class as quickly as possible. That's probably a reasonable version one implementation. But that's all behind the scenes. That's an implementation detail, and the VM can do better uh, if, if it wants to. And then it can ask the language runtime questions about how do I specialize this type so different languages can have different mappings of uh, in uninstantiated signatures to representational classes. And so Java may choose to do its, uh, to have, have erase generics, but one could use the same machinery to generate reified generics. And you know, that's not something that the VM has to pay attention to. It's just asking the language runtime, what's the representation class for this uh, type string? So sort of to sum up, we're actually like getting in decent shape now. We have a pretty reasonable programming model. We have really good compatibility with existing code. And we have a path to a rich, rich uh, sharing approach. Are there cons? Well, there are still some cons. Most of the cons are consequences of compatibility, which is always the stone around our neck. Um, generics in this model are neither erased nor reified. They're a little bit of each. The reference generics are erased like they've always been. The value uh, instantiations are reified. That's a little confusing. But it's sort of, like I said, it's, it's, it's the option we have left available to us without breaking compatibility. 
Yeah, no, it's 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 not it's it's not terrible. It's just um, you know people people will throw rocks at us, right? People will say, "Oh, you guys managed to come up with the only thing that's worse with, than erased, sometimes erased." <laughs> All right, throw your rocks, right? You know, it's not so bad. I I've been writing code with this now for a few months. You can write some pretty nice libraries with it. It's really not so bad. So anyway. Um, that's all. I